I'm Chris Runge, and this is Study Hall. Welcome to Study Hall, the podcast dedicated to getting a little bit smarter about advertising. What's up, study haulers? Imagine, if you will, that you work in an industry that performs a necessary service for capitalism. Everybody needs it. But the product's not necessarily super welcome when it shows up. And further, most of the product is created by agencies, that is, companies that work for other companies. And when you, as somebody who works for an agency, goes to the client company, you're often treated with uh, a mixture of scorn and suspicion. Now, somehow this industry's managed to trade on its reputation of, as being a fun place to work, a good place for creative, interesting, zany people to be. So people are still kind of coming into it, but it's a lot different than it used to be and uh, not all that much fun. Nevertheless, it's been able to keep its head above water because it's kind of changed its business model a little bit over the years and it's become kind of a set of giant holding companies that have enabled, through some sort of magic that you don't understand, a self-sustaining business model for the industry. So there's kind of a future. And one day, it comes out that the way that these holding companies have been keeping the industry in business has been by keeping money that maybe they should have passed on to the client industries. What do you think it would be like to go to work the next day in that business? What do you think your next client meeting would be like in your next 10 client meetings? the next five years in the industry? And what if your iconic publishing house relied on income from that industry to survive? That's the subject of Ken Oletta's book, Frenemies. A pretty good book. That's the topic of this month's double shot of Study Hall. So let's get into it Study Hall style and look at Ken Oletta and try to understand his perspective. Looking at the cover copy, we learn that Ken Oletta's written a column called The Annals of Communication Profiles for The New Yorker since 1992. He's the author of 11 books, and he's been involved in media for a long time uh, and credited in his wiki bio with coining the term information superhighway. Maybe not as au courant as net neutrality, Tim Wu, but still pretty cool. He's been around long enough that he's interviewed most of the prominent figures in media and communication. I think Tim Wu got it right on the cover copy of the book where he likens a letter to Bob Woodward he, in the sense that he's a very establishment journalist that has excellent access and that's on display in frenemies he's also married to a very prominent literary agent she's the agent for for instance Cormac McCarthy so Ken Oletta not only makes his money but he also makes his home in the in the world of giant media properties and in a lot of ways you can understand frenemies as the perspective of a media property guy who's looking at what's going on in advertising and media these days and and beginning to ask himself, hey, where is the money going to come from to create culture if advertising dries up? Even understanding that, you know, the Netflix model is gaining ground, an enormous amount of culture is still supported by advertising dollars. And it's an open question whether subscription can save it or not. I'd probably say no. So Olet is looking at the world of culture and saying, how are we going to keep this going? Which is a huge question. So let's get into the introduction a little. So As he opens the book, he starts telling you a little bit about himself and his interest in disruption. Not disruption in terms of I'm trying to talk and you're interrupting me and I can't make myself heard, but in the business sense of a more or less radical restructuring of an industry because of new technology or new business practices that come into it, right? So he's been interested in disruptors, people who are disrupting industries, and the disrupted people who have been working in an industry that changes radically in a very short period of time. And usually those people suffer a lot. I happen to notice that Aletta went to school in Oswego, New York and Syracuse, New York, uh, areas where there are a lot of people who have, since the mid-70s, lived through a lot of really miserable disruption. So maybe that's where his interest comes from. I don't know. Anyway, in terms of books, he's written a book on the TV networks called Three Blind Mice at a time when the the TV networks were starting to be challenged by the internet. So this is back a few years. And he continued that that interest through a series of books. And then it finally ended up on a book called Googled, which is, of course, about the search engine of similar name. And then he says he got interested in how adjacent sub-industries, while he was writing Googled, were invading each other's turf, of course. And we've all seen that, right? The search engines start to advertise and TV, TV networks start to get onto the internet and everybody's throwing elbows and there's a big fight going on and what, what's happening. 
And so he, he comes to the conclusion that, and this is a quote from the book, trying to understand media without understanding advertising and marketing is like trying to understand the auto industry without regard to fuel costs, which is pretty cool. I think that you know, he understands and he acknowledges in the, in the introduction that advertising and marketing is important for capitalism. We need information transfer, efficient information transfer in market economies. And the best way to do that is to have people that are making products and delivering services advertise those products and services so that they can get the information to all the people that could potentially be interested in their product. And so he he understands advertising and marketing is important. He cares about culture and he's looking at what's going on and he's asking himself what what is going to happen. As he comes to the end of the introduction, he sums it all up in this quote. Ultimately, this is a story of a world whose fate is imperiled and why that matters to us all. This is not just a advertising industry problem. This is a much bigger problem in that the business model that supports our culture and supports the things like the New Yorker, for instance, that are really important cultural forums. What's going to happen to them if advertising goes away? If the model that's underpinned the creation of culture since the Industrial Revolution goes away, right? And also, it's interesting, you know, just parenthetically, a mark of the chaos that, that's going on in the industry right now is that Martin Sorrell and Les Moonves are major figures in this book. And of course, since this book was written and came out, which was less than a year ago, both those men are gone from the industry. It's interesting to note how much the industry has changed just since this book came out. Anyway, All right, so let's move on. Uh, We're going to talk about Chapter 1, The Perfect Storm. And The Perfect Storm opens in Florida at a meeting of the Association of National Advertisers. And at this meeting, a man named John Mandel is speaking. And who is John Mandel? So John Mandel had worked for Gray Advertising for many years, running their, eventually coming to run their media buying department. So he had a lot of credibility in the field of media buying. And then he had gone on to run a company called Dog Sled Enterprises, which was like a watchdog consultancy. So, so and he gets up in front of the ANA and he kind of talks his, talks his business a little bit and says that between 18 and 20% of the trillion dollars that large advertisers are spending on media in America, so well into the nine figures, $100 million plus, is being retained by the ad agency holding companies or the ad agencies themselves when those, those monies really should have been returned to the clients. And this came at a time when, remember, this is 2015. This comes at a time when digital has made these giant inroads into traditional advertising media. And those two forms of media, digital and traditional, are bought in different ways. Digital tends to be, have the reputation of being more transparent. Although I think digital has actually got its own problems with fraud that are costing big money that don't have to do with the price you pay up front but have to do with the interaction of people with the property. The fraud sort of operates in a different way. Instead of being, you know, we got a, we got a, we got a rebate and we didn't give it to you, it tends to be, hey, you're going to pay a dollar per click and 50% of the clicks you pay for are not really clicks, right? So anyway, not to digress too much, but digital had made huge inroads into the traditional media buying space already and people were starting to say, you know, in classic client fashion, hey, I can, I can know exactly how much I'm paying for the media on the digital side, at least that's what I think, and you, you're not telling me you're buying media on what's called sometimes what's called a non-disclosed basis. I'm buy, you're buying media for me. You're not telling me how much you're paying for the media that you're going to sell me, but I'm getting a good price, so I'm not going to worry about how much money you're going to make on the spread between what you paid for the media and what I'm paying for the media. That all makes sense. I feel like you really need a whiteboard to sort of talk about this. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this. Read the article in the show notes. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really pretty good article. And it sets up the, even though it's from 2012, um, and it sets, up the, it sets up the issue that Mandel was talking about really well. And it's from the time that Mandel was, this is before the speech. So this is from the time when the practices Mandel was talking about were actually going on. So it's actually a pretty good, pretty good article. So Mandel throws this giant bomb into the room. It had been known about in the, in the industry for a while, but it hadn't been pushed front and center like Mandel did it. And, you know, these are the biggest advertisers in the nation. And eventually it led to an audit conducted by these guys called K2 Intelligence, which is a very sort of high level 
private investigatory firm. They, they hire FBI agents and ex-U.S. attorneys, and I think Ray Kelly worked for them. It's a big, big deal to have them looking at you. They are heavy, heavy hitters, and if they're looking at your business, you better hope you weren't fiddling your expenses because they will find out about it. Another piece of the picture that in 2015 Mandel was kind of putting his fist through, if you follow the metaphor, Mandel puts his fist through the picture, was that agency fees had been going down. So if you were working at an ad agency, you know, any time between like 20, 2005 and 2015, you were, and you were fairly senior, you were having discussions around, you know, they don't want to pay for this, we don't want to pay for that, cost pressure, cost pressure, cost pressure. And your day-to-day life in the ad agency that might have been owned by an Omnicom, right? Say you're working for an Omnicom agency in New York. Your day-to-day life is all about cost restrictions and cost pressures and less money. And somehow the Omnicoms of the world, the Omnicoms, the publicists, the Havases of the world are making more and more money every year. So how is that happening? Uh, Well, Mandel (laughs) pointed the finger at how that might have been happening, right? They are allegedly diverting... 18 to 20 percent of a trillion dollar market you think that might have like a effect on the bottom line yeah yeah actually might explain how these guys were making were managing to make all this money when procurement departments and clients were pushing so hard on hourly rates for really pretty much all of the 2000s so there this is just a huge as the title says this is a perfect storm this is a massive massive disruption in trust between ad agencies and their clients, which is not to suggest that it had been great up to then. Ad, ad agencies and their clients have been having problems in their relationships for years. We'll get into that in a bit. And just really another really quick digression, agency has a specific legal meaning. That, that is an interesting subtext of the book. I actually wish Aletta had spent a little more time talking about this, but so agency means that you are acting in the best interests of another person right whether a legal person like a company or a natural person like a human being so a is the agent of b that means a goes out into the marketplace and conducts business in the best interests of b not in a's interest right but in b's interest and so these companies these things called advertising agencies were holding themselves out as agency <laughs> it was right in the name right and they turned out to not have been working as agents. They were, they were taking these rebates and they were not passing them on um, when arguably they were actually due the clients. And there's really some really fascinating stuff uh, in the book about that, uh, about how with all the cost pressures happening and with the cost pressures, really, there's a conversation happening about distribution of risk, right? The client wants to pay very little money for advertising. They don't want to pay at all if the advertising doesn't work, right? They're trying to solve Wanamaker's conundrum of, I know half of my advertising dollars are wasted. I just don't know which half, right? They're trying to find the half of the dollars that are wasted. So they're trying to remove all the risk of 50% overspend, or I guess 100% overspend, they're trying to remove all that risk, and the ad agencies, meanwhile, are trying to say, like, look, we, we, don't, we, don't, control the, we don't control everything, so you, you can't make all of that our problem, right? The fact that there's some, some energy is lost to heat in this whole advertising machine, that, that's, not, that's not our fault. We're just, we're just one part of a much larger machine, and why are you picking on us? And into that conversation comes John Mandel and his a speech, and it just makes the whole thing that much worse and really brings it all to a head. And then a riot breaks out. Not really. As Aletta says in the book, there's this massive wave of agency reviews. Sort of like a business riot. What's happening is CEOs are picking up the phone. They call the CMO and they say, listen, you better make sure that we're not caught up in this. And I want to make sure that if they're getting rebates on 20% of our media spend, that those rebates are coming back to us. You need to, you need to ensure that that's happening. So that causes much soul searching (laughs) at the, at the CMO level. And oftentimes what resulted there was the CMO decided, Hey, you know what? We, we need to like relook at this entire situation. And so, and when the CMO starts thinking like that, you better put on your pitching shoes because the agency review has come. So in that way, the agencies got caught up in this, in this, like I said, this really the final nail in the, in the trust coffin. So. Into that world comes this other, we meet this other character, a guy named Michael Kassan, who runs a company called MediaLink. And MediaLink essentially 
functions as an interpreter. MediaLink's business model is they go into the scary and often hard to understand world of advertising and they kind of reduce the risk by acting as a guide. So if you spend all your life in a, in a large company like Procter & Gamble, say, and you haven't spent a lot of time on the agency side, Michael Kassan and his people can kind of come in and help you manage agencies, along with a lot of other stuff. That's not the only thing that MediaLink does. MediaLink, for instance, MediaLink also has a headhunting practice, and they have a strategic uh, marketing practice, and all these other facets of their business that essentially mo help monetize uncertainty. It's really well worth clicking around their website and, and of course, reading Ken Oletta's description of them. So we meet Kassan, and Kassan is, is running a lot of these agency reviews that come out of the John Mandel speech and the kerfuffle that follows it. And then we get into a discussion of RFPs. That's a very interesting discussion. Oletta kind of summarizes the six key questions you're going to be asked in an RFP. I'll just summarize them here. Cost savings, risk share, which is a new question. And risk share is basically what I was talking about before. How, if, if the advertising does really well and helps sell a lot of product, we, the client, are willing to let you participate in that. But if the advertising doesn't do very well, we want to be able to pay you less. Very interesting idea. It's, it's, it's actually, it's a lot deeper than it sounds. Um, a lot more difficult to make work than it sounds, but it's a really important issue, and it, and it goes directly at Wanamaker's conundrum. So, again, cost savings, risk share, market strategy, speed of turnaround, data and analytics, and importantly, who owns the data? Does, is the data the client's data, or is it the ad agency's data? And talent. And these RFPs are being fired into a very troubled industry. Aletta kind of finishes off with a portrait of advertising which you know if you've been in advertising for the last few years you've lived it it's just the agency the agency world is caught in this terrible downward spiral of low profit margins very tight budgets and a dynamic where those low margins and tight budgets drive the staffing of accounts with junior people who really can't maintain the kind of high level relationships that agencies once had with clients where the David Ogilvies of the world went and spoke to the heads of Procter & Gamble. And you need to have those relationships. You need to add value at that level if you want to justify premium pricing. And so we end chapter one kind of with the question, how, how do we get here? So the first part of that answer comes in the second chapter. Change sucks. There's a quote from Martin Sorrell that begins the chapter. I'm prepared to eat our children because if I don't, Somebody else will. Charming quote by Martin Sorrell, CEO of WPP, which of course is one of the biggest, I think the biggest um, advertising agency holding company in the world. Chain Sucks is basically uh, a review of all the threats that are facing advertising today. And in that chapter, we sort of go through a quick review of the rise of advertising in the 20th century. I'm not going to get into it. I think it's an okay history. If you're really interested in the history of advertising, Take a look at the attention merchants. It's a better, more scholarly history than what's going on here. Although this isn't bad. It moves from the history of advertising into a justification for the existence of advertising. And he, he uses a quote from Jeremy, Jeremy Bullmore, who used to be head of, um, used to be chairman, excuse me, of J. Walter Thompson, who now works for WPP. So this is what Bullmore has to say about advertising. Edison didn't actually say, who makes the best mousetrap? The world will beat a path to his door. If he had said it, it would have been observed. If you build a better mousetrap and you're in the woods, until somebody knows you've got the better mousetrap, there's no point in building it. He cites the former Soviet Union and its satellites. Look at communist countries. No advertising. None of the consumer goods companies thought it necessary or worthwhile to innovate because if you do do something that's quite interesting, but you can't tell anyone about it, and your competition are not doing it, why bother? Unquote. I would only add to that that the communist states did advertise, but they advertised ideologies and not products. So. Again, an apologia about the power of advertising, the importance of advertising. And then it becomes a catalog of threats. First, the threat is MediaLink. They're able to tell the story that advertising is complex and perhaps even a little fiscally dangerous. And it's probably better to have an expert guide you through the process of doing advertising than, sort, than to take it on yourself. And that seems to be getting some traction. So Kassan threatens the relationship of the big ad agencies or any ad agency with their clients, which is very important to ad agencies. How do you justify value if you're not in the C-suite helping to solve problems and build a business? 
And if you can't be in the C-suite because Michael Kassan's in the C-suite saying, don't talk to those guys, they're a bunch of dangerous charlatans, that's a problem for your business. And that makes Martin Sorrell quite angry. And then there's other, there's other frenemies too, Google and Facebook, right? They're, they're purveyors of information. They'll tell you about the mousetraps. It's how people find out about the mousetraps. And they're willing to take money to deliver a commercial message. So they're kind of in the way of ad agencies, <clears throat> excuse me, ad agencies and clients. They're kind of coming between the ad agency and the client. And as Sorrell says, they've got better data. And digital competitors having better data isn't the only data problem agencies have. Higher quality data holds out the promise of better, more effective ads, but may expose excess or inefficient ads, and the greater accountability may not be so good. I mean, if you think about Wanamaker's paradox, half of my money is wasted, I just don't know which half, or is conundrum really, it's not a paradox, more of a conundrum. In a world where data is perfect, you know which half you're wasting, which implies that you can cut you're spending in half, which is not good news for ad agencies. And of course, people are worried about, people in ad agencies are worried about the privacy backlash. I mean, we've all lived this sort of Facebook sneaky monetizing of everyone's data without their consent scandal. And I've noticed that some people are starting to ask themselves, why should Facebook make all this money off my data? Why shouldn't I make some money off my data? So there may be, there may be, and probably will be, a lot less data to go around as time goes by. Other threats. Scary technology. AI and algorithms are replacing human creatives. This is happening. This was in a meeting in 2018 where we were using ads that were written by an algorithm. Smartphones are taking over communications. People are able to get messages on their smartphones. Then the messages may not necessarily look like advertising. They might be in the form of SMS messages, text messages. So why, you know, is that really advertising? And then finally, could there be, you know, Amazon is another, another threat where they have such good data on you that they approach this kind of singularity where they know what you want before you want it. And is there any point in, is there any point in doing advertising at all? So there's scary tech. And then finally, there's a loss of trust and a bad business model. Agencies, and we'll get into this a little bit more in, in the next chapter, Goodbye Don Draper, but agencies are kind of a terrible business model. They've, they've, they really have not adapted their businesses to the needs of the 21st century, and they've made some historical errors in the way that they've set up the, especially the revenue model for ad agencies. And now they're, they're reaping the whirlwind. The things they've had to do to stay profitable, like retaining rebates that should have gone to clients or staffing accounts with very junior people have eroded the trust of their clients and destroyed their claims that they add value. You know, it's, it's really hard to be sure that you're getting the best talent as a client. Are you getting the best media choices? Can you really trust that you're getting the best creatives and they're, they're doing the best kind of tactics for you and that those tactics are being rolled out through the best possible channels? I think a lot of clients, quite rightly, are concerned about these issues. And agencies don't generally have good answers for them. So we end up with this sort of survey of what's really scaring the ad agencies today. And then, lest you think he's overstating the point, he ends with the following quotes. Deep down, Kassan, like most media executives he advises, fears that marketing dollars will not just be redirected. They will actually shrivel. Their fear calls to mind this brief exchange between two friends in Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises. Bill Gordon. How did you go bankrupt? Mike Campbell. Two ways, gradually and then suddenly. So what he's saying here is that while it may not seem like a, a big issue right now, it may be hard to imagine that we could be facing the final fatal crisis of advertising and also culture. That's how things end. There's a slow decline, then a quicker decline, and then one day the lights just go out. He makes a strong case, and it's an uncomfortable chapter. And so we come to chapter three, Goodbye Don Draper, in which we learn that the wounds that are borne by advertising agencies today are very much self-inflicted. So this chapter, Goodbye Don Draper, chapter three, is set up in a sort of a funky way. And so I'm going to kind of synopsize it in a way that I think makes sense, uh, more sense than the way Ken Oletta wrote it. <laughs> Sorry, Ken. So the chapter starts with a quick explanation of the golden age ad agency revenue model. This is how it would work. There's newspapers, right? The media property owners, there's the advertising agency, and then there's the client of the advertising agency. Those are the three parties involved in this transaction. When the advertiser comes to the ad agency, 
and says, I have $100 to spend on media. This is how the money breaks down. First, the ad agency takes $17.65 of that media spend as commission. Then it took the balance of the money the client had given them and, and gave it to the media property, so the newspaper. So the newspaper got 100 minus 17.65, which is the advertising agency commission. The newspaper then turned around and gave 15% of that money back to the ad agency. So it was an incredibly lucrative model. They were doing very well out of it. The problem was um, they never really justified the value. I think that's what, what Alette is really saying. So he sort of goes through the chapter explains how the model worked, explains how the titans of advertising in the mid 20th century fought over what made a good ad campaign. That really put me in mind of talent and the kind of talent a business model that's that lucrative can attract. So when you're making 17.65% from the client and then the media property owner is paying you an additional 15% and then you're getting production costs from the client, then you can afford to hire some pretty top flight guys. You can get a David Ogilvy, you can get a Ross or Reeves, right? Those are the kind of guys that are gonna show up. And so that's how advertising was in the golden age of Don Draper. A lot of the luminous golden quality of those times literally came from gold. The problem was, the fatal flaw was, that there was no real pricing, there was no real power behind that revenue model. Also, it encouraged agencies to sort of overspend on media, of course, because they were going to get commission out of it. And here's where I kind of quibble with Aletta. He fast forwards in the chapter to the rise of procurement departments after the financial crises in the 90s and in the early 2000s. And yes, everybody loves to shit on procurement, but he misses one really important fact, saves it to later. And here's what blew my mind in this chapter. The first person to start pulling on the threads of this revenue model was David Ogilvy. He was the one who converted Shell to a fee-based account in 1960. And he said at the time, this makes me a better representative of Shell, right? I can do better deals for them because I'm not pressured to max out the media spend because I'm making a commission on the media spend. But the problem is, somewhere along the line, once we started talking about fees, we ended up making the conversation with the client all about price and not about value. And I think, although Aletta doesn't really go into this, I'd like to spend more time looking at this, really. But I think that's because the pricing model was never founded on any real value. There was no advertising mine, right, that was super difficult to get to and hard to get advertising out of so that we could charge a high price for it. It was just a bunch of smart people doing advertising and kind of just getting away with what they got away with. And so because the model can't really get its arms around the value that advertising adds, We've been struggling ever since with how to value our work. Okay, so digression over. Let's get back to the chapter. So we've gone to a fee base, and, and it wasn't long in the grand scheme of things until the procurement department showed up. The procurement department showed up and started cracking down on prices, and that really drove the death spiral of the industry. We went from a model where we could afford to get the Ross or Reeves and the David Ogilvies of the world to come work in the advertising industry to a model where we can't necessarily afford extraordinary people. And, you know, and it's, and it's right in the book, in Frenemies, they say, you know, if you can make, if you can make 60,000 working for Google, why would you pass that up and, and go make 40,000 working for an ad agency? And that's, that's absolutely right. So, it's, a, it's an interesting meditation on business models. If you don't have a business model where you're, really, where you're really talking about value or you have a monopoly and you're just dictating price, you're really vulnerable. And ad agencies learned that to their great sorrow after, two, after the financial crisis of 2000, as I say, when procurement started showing up and driving down prices. So then we get into a really, you know, he ends the chapter on a very depressing note. He cites a couple of really depressing statistics. So 47% of people in advertising over five years. So if you've been in advertising over five years and you were in this survey, they said morale is low due to inadequate leadership, lack of advancement, and dissatisfaction with work. And then LinkedIn did a survey of nine industries and advertising as an industry ranked dead last in work-life balance. It ranked dead last in long-term strategic vision. And it ranked next to last in comp and benefits in career path and job security. Also next to last in uh, value employee contribution. So nobody's thriving. 
really, in the ad world anymore, except for one guy, a real master of chaos, who we'll meet in the next chapter in more detail, but his name is Mike Kassan. So who is Mike Kassan? Well, among other things, he's the subject of Chapter 4 of Frenemies, and Chapter 4 is entitled The Matchmaker. And I guess I'm not going to go through every aspect of, of Kassan's life, and Chapter 4 is pretty much a bio of Michael Kassan, but if I had to put a bumper sticker together of him, I would say this guy is comfortable with risk. And I think what sets him apart, what's interesting to Mike, the Michael Kassan that comes out in frenemies, what's interesting to that, to me about that Michael Kassan is what makes him so comfortable with chaos is that he's comfortable taking risks and he's very able at extricating himself when things go south. What do I mean? So uh, in chapter four, we learn that Kassan had been a lawyer, is a lawyer, still a lawyer. And he had been working for the El Pollo Loco franchises and basically moved some money around, took some money from California franchises to subsidize franchises in Nevada that weren't doing well. He did so without the consent of the board, and that was a felony. And he pled guilty. He was placed on probation for a year, and he was suspended from the California bar. And he was, that, that would, that's enough to sink most people, but not Kassan. Kassan turned around and served out his probation for his conviction. Then he got the board, the California State Bar, to reinstate him as an attorney. And he slowly built his way back and found a way, looked at the advertising business, and figured out a way to live in it through this company, MediaLink, which is really, really, really smart. He sits between the big advertisers, the consumers of advertising services and the ad agencies themselves and serves as a guide as an, and as an interpreter and essentially makes money off the fact that trust and respect has degenerated to the point where nobody on the client side feels like it's a good idea to venture into advertising without a guide, sort of like a third world slum. Think about that. It's an extraordinary fall for an industry that within living memory was Mad Men. And so now instead of David Ogilvy and Bill Bernbach, we have Michael Kassan. The company he runs, MediaLink, is pretty large. It has 120 employees and they're divided into six divisions. And those divisions are data and tech, which is run by someone with an Omnicom background, marketing optimization, which is run by somebody from Deutsch, business acceleration, which seems to be about helping legacy media turn into digital media, emerging media, and then investor strategy, which seems to be all about getting you money or helping you sell a business that you've developed, and then their talent division, which is a headhunting practice. But it seems like the main thing that they do is broker information. And like any company that brokers information between clients and has quasi-secret or proprietary information from clients, they face conflict of interest uh, issues, which... Kassan deals with by saying no conflict, no interest, which I think is a little bit glib. But there's no disputing that this guy knows everybody and people trust him, which gives him enormous power. And so whether or not you believe there's a material conflict of interest, you're sort of forced to deal with him. At least that's the impression Aletta gives you. Now, that's not to say that Aletta is totally doing a hagiography of the guy. At the end of the chapter, he has a couple of quotes from people who don't like what Kassan is doing. Here's a quote from page 72. Michael Kassan has his critics, though the fiercest criticism is usually volunteered only after the critic is guaranteed anonymity. Quote, MediaLink is like the mafia. You pay them for protection, unquote. The CEO of one tech firm who retained them says, quote, I used to pay them $20,000 a month during year one. Year two went up to $25,000 per month. At first, I'd meet with Michael and Wenda. Wenda is the number two person at uh, MediaLink. Then you're dealing with a kid. You pay the money so you can go to their CES party. I no longer pay, so I'm no longer invited, unquote. Kassan counters, quote, only clients are invited, unquote. Aghast at what he sees is the contradiction between where advertising is heading and the P.T. Barnum character that Mike, Michael Kassan represents. One digital executive fumes, quote, we have an industry that says we are moving from art to science, away from the hucksterism and ledger domain of the last two centuries, and into an era of definable return on investment. They can identify who watched an ad and whether it registered a sale. And who is the character that is the connective tissue for the entire industry? It's a guy who is all ledger domain and hucksterism, unquote. So certainly people notice what Kassan is doing and say to themselves, hey, this sort of seems like 
uh, there might be an opportunity for some impropriety and there might be an opportunity to play favorites and you're not super transparent and how do you know we're not doing that? And there doesn't seem to be, as I say, there doesn't seem to be a very good answer to that, at least in chapter four. Aletta sort of goes through these criticisms and then he quotes Kassan as saying, no conflict, no interest, which I think is, even for a guy who's supposedly as charming and lighthearted as Michael Kassan is, is just not a satisfying answer. For instance, would a former U.S. attorney working for K2 agree with Kassan that no conflict, no interest, or would they say conflict? I'm kind of interested. So if it's not a satisfying answer, why are people so interested in the things that MediaLink and Michael Kassan have to offer? And in Chapter 5, entitled Anxious Clients, uh, Aletta starts to answer that question. So Chapter 5 opens on a restaurant where Michael Kassan is going for dinner. And he's talking to a client, and the client is saying, I'm not really comfortable with this. You seem like you have a lot of potentials for conflict of interest. And this is what Kassan says, quote, look at it this way. We're fortunate we get to kiss a lot of girls, unquote, Kassan told him. Quote, we never kiss and tell. It just informs our ability as kissers. So if you want a good kisser, we're your date, unquote. Again, a very uh, glib and seemingly superficial answer to a pretty serious question. That's kind of Michael Kassan's sort of charming roguishness coming through, I suppose. So why is this metaphor of a good kisser so compelling? Well, in Chapter 5, Aletta kind of goes through a parade of horribles that advertising agency clients are facing and the things that they do to try to deal with those sort of smoky, difficult-to-see-through areas of their business where it's really important that they get it right. But with the way communication technology is now and the way we get commercial messages to people now, it's difficult to point at a strategy and say, we are confident that this is going to work. Or when a strategy succeeds, to point at yourself and say, I did this in a mindful and purposeful way, a professional way. And if that's the case, what value do CMOs provide or senior marketers at all? If it's all just a crapshoot, why hire a high dollar expert? Why not just hire a random number generator? In that world, somebody peddling answers, like Michael Kassan is peddling, even if he does seem like kind of a huckster and full of ledger domain, would be attractive. And that's the essence of the chapter. There are some other interesting things about the chapter. Like, for instance, you meet Gary Vaynerchuk, who is interesting for a couple of reasons. First is, you learn that Vaynerchuk got his start in his dad's wine shop, which he turned into a pretty hot digital property and grew the business tremendously. Then decided to get into the ad agency business because he had demonstrated he knew how to do digital advertising. And Vaynerchuk is held out as this incredibly ambitious guy who, while he's in digital media at the moment, wants it all. And that really resonated with me because it's an incredibly inefficient way to do business. It's a really exhausting way to live. If nobody knows what's happening, you're kind of under the obligation, if you're an ambitious and a competent person, to try to get everything you can. And if nobody knows what's happening, isn't everything on the table? Now that sounds like a lot of fun opportunity, but consider how much time and effort is going to be wasted by people chasing after business. They really have no right pursuing and are going to mess up if they happen to win. Again, another reason to like Michael Kassan because he offers a point of view, at least, that you can sort of interact with and not be all alone. And I think that's a powerful part of his appeal. Because we can't stop doing advertising and marketing just because it's difficult. And that's how chapter six ends. We close the chapter learning about Bank of America, and, which is, of course, a giant American bank. And after the financial crisis, they needed to make connections with customers that reassured these customers that they weren't going to get taken advantage of in the way that we all saw that we'd been taken advantage of by financial institutions during you know, 2008, 2009, and the years following. So they have to do this outreach. And the question is, how? And the chapter ends on kind of a disturbing note. You sort of don't know how Bank of America is going to accomplish that goal. So then we get into chapter six, which is entitled The Same Height as Napoleon, which is all about Martin Sorrell, the CEO of WPP, the largest advertising holding company in the world. And essentially the function of this chapter is to just to set up the threat posed by Google and Facebook. Although at in reading the chapter, we learn a lot about advertising. We learn a lot about Martin Sorrell, who turns out to be a much more interesting, multi-layered, and intelligent fellow than I certainly thought he was. I mean, his reputation in the advertising industry really couldn't be worse. Actually, in reading this chapter, I came away with a lot more empathy and a lot more respect for Martin Sorrell than I had previous to, writing, to reading this chapter. So a ton of this chapter is 
a biography of Martin Sorrell, which I'm not really going to get into except to say it's worth a read and trust me, he's a much more nuanced and intelligent person than you might get from listening to Martin Sorrell war stories in a, in a bar room in Manhattan. And there's, a, it, there's actually an interesting little tidbit about holding company history on page 104. It turns out the guy who started the holding company idea in advertising was a guy named Marion Harper Jr., who was president of McCann Erickson. He bought a bunch of agencies, which were then considered very good businesses. Warren Buffett was investing in ad agencies at that time, and Harper founded Interpublic Group. And the idea, I guess, was cost-cutting and getting to be a big company would make you able to raise prices. How the world has changed. The function of this chapter is just to position Sorrell as a sage and then point the sage at Google and Facebook and identify them as frenemies of the ad industry. And that brings us to chapter seven. Now, chapter seven is the chapter that gives the book its title, Frenemies. And this chapter contains a solid statement of the major problem facing ad agencies today. Unfortunately, chapter seven, like chapter six, suffers from the passage of time. Chapter 6, of course, because Martin Sorrell is no longer head of WPP. And Chapter 7, frenemies, because Facebook is no longer the unbeatable internet force that it seemed when uh, Kenaletta wrote this book. In Chapter 7, he quotes a guy named Patrick Keene, who used to be president of a company called ShareThrough.com, which competed with Facebook for ad dollars. Quote, it's a Facebook world we all live in, he says, noting that Facebook and Google leave advertising pennies for other digital platforms. Facebook has this incredible, almost instantaneous ability to be successful in anything. They turned their biggest liability, they were late to focus on mobile, into an asset almost overnight." Unquote. In light of events that happened after this book was written and published, I think that quote carries a lot less credibility than it once did. But even though Facebook's not the power it once was, a lot of the issues that are called out in this chapter are still worth going through. So let's go through the synopsis here. In this chapter, we meet Carolyn Everson, who's the VP of Global Marketing Solutions at Facebook. And she claims she's not a frenemy of agencies. Sorrell says different, of course. What Sorrell says is because Facebook is selling Facebook inventory, uh, and since they control the data about how people interact with the platform, they're able to serve up better solutions to advertisers than the agencies. And in the chapter, you realize that goes all the way down to even setting up an ad campaign, which you can do from the comfort of your desktop on Facebook. And of course, try doing that with any ad agency. It's going to be a much more painful and costly process. So, and that's, that would be true of, that'll be true of whatever's next digitally. It doesn't, doesn't really matter so much that Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg and all the sort of Facebook cast of characters have been cast down into the dust as privacy hating data pimps. I guess would be the best way to put it. That'll be true until consumers rebel against having their data taken and used for commercial purposes, which is the topic of actually chapter nine, the privacy time bomb. So this whole frenemy dynamic is perfectly encapsulated in the reaction to the Facebook forum, which is a thing that Carolyn Everson conceived of and sponsored, really. So it's basically the Facebook forum is a meeting of all the minds in commercial messaging to consumers, formerly known as advertising. And they all get together in a big room and Facebook runs it and it's all about solutions. Now, Unilever loves it. There's a quote from Unilever's head of marketing saying, this is great, I hear all kinds of great solutions and it's a great ferment of ideas and on and on and on. Whereas there's a, and there's a, um, there's a quote from an agency person that's calling it a grin fuck. Those of you who aren't familiar with grin fucking, <laughs> the guy provides a helpful explanation of what grin fucking is. It's when you are grinning at somebody as you stab them in the back. And what the agency guy is essentially saying is, we're going here, Facebook is pretending that we're equal partners when in fact Facebook is setting up to take everything away from us. And there's also an interesting thing in there about the quality of creative, and there's some knocks on Facebook creative, and there's a quote in there where someone's sort of saying, Facebook advertising is really the lowest common denominator of advertising, and it's not creatively that good. And that, I thought, was a very interesting quote because, of course, as we approach the advertising consumer singularity where your wants and needs are totally anticipated and really all you need is an alert that this product or service is available so that you can go and consummate your desire with it, what need creative? Why do we need it to make it interesting or arresting or anything? It's just 
It just needs to be a text message. Hey, that thing that you always wanted, well, it's available on Amazon now. And so without really getting too deeply into it, there's a, there's a real creative issue here as well, which is cool. It's cool to read about. It's not, <laughs> not cool that it's actually happening, especially if you're a creative director or a copywriter or an art director or indeed anybody who makes their living in traditional advertising medium. So then, you know, we kind of see that the Facebook disruptors are already gathering. So to be fair, Aletta does notice that Facebook isn't going to be around forever. And there are things waiting to take its place. Although even then, I'd argue that Snapchat and Periscope are kind of, I don't know, I think things are happening really, really fast right now. And I think in five years, the media landscape will be dominated by something we haven't even heard of yet. And then we kind of get to the ultimate frenemy, the boss frenemy. As bad as Facebook is, as bad as Google is, and I just realized I didn't really talk much about Google, but Google's in the mix as well. Google does the same thing that Facebook does, although I think it, it looks like that Aletta doesn't have access to Google people as well as he does to Facebook people, especially this woman, Carolyn Everson, who it turns out, according to the book, a very good friend of who? Michael Kassan. And so I think there's that maybe, you know, he was able to get, I don't know what the story is with him getting access, but I, you can't help but notice when you're reading the book that, oh, Carolyn Everson and Michael Kassan are very close. And interestingly, she makes a prominent appearance in this book that's, that seems to be the story of Michael Kassan. I'll go into that more in the second half. I'll also note that Aletta mentions in the author's note that he talked to Everson as much as he did at the exclusion of Google because he wanted to switch it up, having written uh, the book Googled. That's fair enough, although I, I think I would have liked to have seen the Google perspective represented in this book. So, as bad as Google and Facebook are, the big, the big frenemy boss is Amazon, because what, what can Amazon do? Amazon is a search engine, Amazon is a advertising substrate, and Amazon is also a store. And on the back end, Amazon is this incredibly sophisticated data gatherer and data analyzer. It owns that data, and it can serve up ads based on the insights it gleans from that data. And you can't buy that data. And it's a real problem for advertising agencies because, again, you, you know, a lot of the content you can just create on Amazon. You don't need any special help to do it, at least at the very basic level. You could probably make an argument that in order to optimize your Amazon marketing, you need an expert. But, you know, to, do, to get to 80%, it, just to pick a number out of the air, to get to 80%, you don't necessarily need an expert. So Amazon is also a huge threat. And despite the fact, we sort of end on the idea that despite the fact that advertising agencies are clearly worried about this. And Sorrell, again, Martin Sorrell, is, sees all of these actors, Google, Facebook, and Amazon as frenemies. Nobody can escape dealing with them. And we see that, of course, spending in these, in these platforms, especially Facebook, continue to grow. Although, again, I think the passage of time has not been kind to Chapter 7. But the larger point, I think, is still germane in that digital advertising continues to grow. And digital advertising isn't just spending on digital billboards. Digital advertising is spending on a very sophisticated advertising ecosystem that is both easier to use for advertisers and richer in terms of the data that it can, that it can produce and is operated by commercial entities like Google, Facebook, and Amazon that are more or less in direct conflict with advertising. So I, I'm going to come down on the Sorrell side of this, that, that these guys actually are frenemies of advertising agencies. Which brings us to Chapter 8, The Rise of the Media Agencies, in which we meet Erwin Gottlieb, who we kind of met earlier. He's the head of Group M. That's WPP's biggest profit generator, right? So going back to the beginning of the book, where were the ad agency holding companies making up for the lost billings of the agencies? They were making it up in media. and. Guys like Erwin Gottlieb and Group M were the ones who were dealing in these rebates. They were at the center of the rebate scandal, or they were 50% of the rebate scandal. Now, Group M is a huge player in the ad industry. In 2015, Group M controlled $75 billion in ad spend, almost 20% of the total. And, and the center of the problem that we run into in Chapter 8 is that as media feedbacks more data, it makes individualized messaging possible, right? Because you know more about me and you know more about what I care about. So you can deliver a message to me either at a time when I'm most susceptible to it, or you can make the content of the message something that I'm more likely to be interested in because you know 
how I behave and who I am. Well, the media agencies have started doing a lot of that data crunching because, of course, you need a lot of data crunching to be able to get an, indiv uh, an accurate individualized message to 230 million people or whatever, however many we're up to in the United States these days. And then as you think about worldwide, I mean, yeah, you, you really need a lot of computing power. And then media agencies have been doing a lot of this, and the media agencies have also been getting a little bit into, into creative, in quotes, as well. Because, because once you decide what the message should be, and like I said before, as we approach ad singularity world where you don't really need a creative veneer, you may just need pure information, why worry about creative? Why not just make a text message and send it to people? And hey, uh, media agencies can do that as well as, uh, as, as you know, Droga5 can. Droga 5, for those of you that didn't hear my first podcast on Andrew Essex's book, The End of Advertising as We Know It, Droga 5 is a very high-end ad agency, very, very highly creative ad shop. You may not need them, though, if the Erwin Gottlieb approach to advertising is true, and you really, you just need good data. And of course, the real question isn't either or, it's how much. So you use some of this data-driven, low-creative, high-information advertising to supplement a high-creative campaign. So if you're an ad agency, the question becomes, how much revenue am I going to lose to these guys and how slowly am I going to bleed to death? The media agencies have become frenemies of their former allies. That's how bad it's gotten. And they're also frenemies of Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and Apple, and Netflix too, because it's a question of who's getting the best data. And all of these platforms have two roles. They have the role that you encounter as a consumer at Google. You're putting stuff into the search bar. Facebook, you're doing whatever people do on Facebook. Amazon, you're buying things. Apple, you're downloading and listening to podcasts and buying your uh, iPod and all your dongles. Don't get me started. And, uh, and Netflix, too, because they, they know what you're watching. Not only are they feeding you what you want as a consumer, of course, they're gathering data on your behavior, and that is huge. And if you can crack the code, you're going to make a ton of money. And the proof of this is Erwin Gottlieb is spending $2.5 billion on his analysis tech. He's placing a big bet, but will it pay off? But even this ad nirvana is threatened because... People don't like their data being used commercially with either without their consent or without participating in the profits. So here's a quote from Eric Salama. Quote, there is an implied contract where people are getting all this content for free, but someone has to pay for it and the pay for it comes through advertising. But that's an implied contract, not an explicit contract. And people are being targeted on the basis of their behavior. And we need to be much more open with people that when they sign up for something, that they know what they are signing up for. Unquote. And of course, we're seeing this in the U.S., and we've started to see this since frenemies came out. There are now privacy laws in the United States that mandate that people be made aware that their data is being used by the website. And that's why you see that little bar across the, the bottom of your browser when you go on certain websites saying, hey, we're using cookies. They're fun and great. And so we start to get into Tim Wu territory, where the consumers themselves are becoming the frenemies of advertising. And could, if that trend continues or intensifies, pose yet another threat to getting commercial messages to people in a way that is profitable to traditional advertising agencies and advertising agency holding companies. So then we get into the section of the book that concerns itself with the consumer as friend of me. Chapter 9 is entitled The Privacy Time Bomb. And to sum that chapter up very quickly, it's just all about how your phone is tracking you at a level that's stunning. That's all you can really say. It's just a total invasion of privacy through the portal of your phone. And then we get to chapter 10, which is entitled The Consumer is Frenemy, which is essentially about ad blockers, along with the rise of mobile and generational differences in consumption and expectations about advertising, which we've covered in depth in other uh, podcasts. So in this chapter, there's the obligatory Tim Cook story. And then we meet a guy named Til Faeda who's the founder and CEO of Adblocker. And at a conference in Brooklyn, he meets Richard Rothenberg, who's the CEO of the Interactive Advertising Bureau, which is a trade group. Uh, when they were at a big conference, Rothenberg got, gets up and refuses to shake Fida's hand, which is a punk move in my view. Uh, but Rothenberg considers Fida a thief. He's getting content for free, and Adblocker users are free riders. And that spawned basically the native advertising craze. Unless you think the native advertising craze is just sort of benign, fake New York Times stories, here's a couple of quotes for you. 
the first is a near psychotic commentary by Michael Kassan on content creation. Hearst and Condé Nast are now content companies, meaning ad agencies. If every brand today wants to create content as opposed to interrupting you with a commercial, then what the hell do I need a commercial for? I want to reach the point where premium content is like pornography, and Nirvana is when you can't tell the difference between the content and the advertising. This just seems like a bad idea. I've said this before. Consumers are always going to choose genuine content over fake content. But wait, it gets worse. So when Netflix came out with Narcos, they paid the Wall Street Journal to put together a series on the Medellin drug cartel. So Aletta asks Jonathan Friedland, who's a former Wall Street Journal reporter, now chief communications officer for Netflix, whether there was any journalistic ethical problem in his mind. This was Mr. Friedland's response. Quote, it works like this. We go to news organization X and say, hey, we would like you to come up with some ideas to enhance interest in show Y. They come back with themes and constituent elements in support of those, and we decide which ones we like. At Netflix, at least, I have insisted when the marketing folks embark on this type of thing, they give the news organization complete freedom. Unquote. So, yuck. I'm in no position to judge, but I really don't like that. For what I think are obvious reasons. So net-net advertising is starting to become this sort of weird kind of not advertising, and Aletta seems to be saying that this is extremely dangerous. What's going to happen is we're going to end up with commercial messages that don't look like advertising, that don't send out the traditional signals that allow us to kind of block out information in Andrew Essex's great phrase to combat infobesity, right? And if we can't do that, What's going to happen to our ability to critically analyze the options available to us? Whether commercial, political, or even moral, it's sobering. So, Aletta ends chapter 10 with a quote from Daniel J. Borston. Quote, We risk being the first people in history to have been able to make their illusions so vivid, so persuasive, so, quote, realistic, unquote, that they can live in them, unquote. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in my illusions. I want to live in the truth. That's where we're going to leave it for this episode of Study Hall. As I said at the top of the show, we're going to have a double shot this month. So so be on the lookout for the next Study Hall, where we'll cover the second half of Ken Aletta's book. Congratulations, you just got out of Study Hall. I want to thank Henry Veloso for the music and say sorry about the editing. I did it myself. Study Hall is sponsored by Douglas & Runke, an advertising and marketing consultancy. See you next time.